A time to thank and praise God. Let's talk to God together. Dear Father, we thank you for all the gifts you freely give us each day. We thank you for life and health and safety, for power to work and time to rest. And we thank you for all that is beautiful in this world and in our lives. But above all, we praise you for our Saviour, Jesus Christ, for his death and resurrection, for the gift of your spirit, and for the hope of sharing in your glory. This morning, please fill our hearts with your grace and peace. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Good morning, everyone. That was awesome music. Thank you. Okay, so today's English lesson, we have three words and phrases and nouns. So the first one, we've got bravado, which is a noun. Bravado is when you look courageous or confident in order to impress other people. It is an outward display of self-confidence. It is a show of bravery or defiance. Sometimes a person's bravado can be fake. Other words with a similar meaning include boasting, swagger, bluster. Example one. In the world of professional wrestling, Mr. Scott Hall showed that if you have bravado, then you can do almost anything. Hall was one of wrestlers' most famous bad guys, a Cuban immigrant named Razor Ramon. Razor once said, I come from Gutter. I know that. I got no education, but who needs it? Look at my clothes. Look at all the gold I'm wearing. I'm a success. That's a lot of bravado. Example two. In the movie Die Hard, actor Bruce Willis plays New York policeman, Mr. John McClane, who is fighting terrorists inside a Los Angeles office tower all by himself. McLean is full of bravado and during the film he says things like, I'm just a fly in the ointment, the monkey in the wrench and welcome to the party, pal. I was trying to do that with an American accent but it didn't work. Um, discussion time. Which of these people has the most bravado? Former US President Trump, footballer Cristiano Ronaldo, or actor Leonardo DiCaprio. You have two minutes. <laughs> okay, the next one is a phrase. It's called in vain. If you do something in vain, then you try to do it, but it doesn't work. Your effort is not effective. Although you keep doing the same thing over and over again, you are not successful. There is no lasting benefit. It was a waste of time and effort. Example one. After working on the physics question for the whole day, Rachel suddenly realised that she had done the wrong question, so all her effort was in vain. Rachel would have to start all over again, this time with the right question. Example two. The man ran as fast as he could to catch the bus, but his effort was in vain. The bus left without him. The next one is flimsy. This is an adjective. The word flimsy can be used in several different ways, including a flimsy objective is weak because it's made of a weak material. A flimsy object is badly made. It's not strong, it's fragile. Two, if you describe evidence or an excuse as being flimsy, then you mean that it is not very good. The excuse or evidence is not convincing. The evidence or reason is poor. It's not believable. Three, if you describe clothing as being flimsy, then it's very thin and doesn't give you much protection. 
Example one. A new study suggests that the link between eating red meat and heart disease and cancer is flimsy. Head researchers at Dalhousie University, Canada, Mr. Bradley Johnston says eating less red meat only marginally improves health outcomes. Example two. UK officials say that record number of refugees are trying to cross the English Channel at night, but they are using flimsy boats and large dinghies. Officials say that more than 28,000 people have crossed the Channel in 2021 compared with about 8,000 in 2019. Discussion time. So talk to the person near you. What is the most flimsy excuse you have ever heard? You have two minutes. That's it for English lesson today. Thank you. A time to hear and think about God's word. Before we hear God's word, let's pray. Gracious God and Father, Lord, Open our eyes so that we will see. Lord, open our ears so that we will hear. Lord, open our hearts so that we will understand. Lord, open our hearts so that we will obey. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today's reading comes from Psalm 2. Why do the nations rage? And why do the people keep making hopeless plans? Why do the kings of the earth prepare for battle? And why do the rulers make plans against the Lord and against his chosen king, saying, let us free ourselves from God and rip off his chains? But one whose throne is in heaven sits laughing. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he speaks to them in his anger. In his burning fury, he terrifies them, saying, I have installed my king on Zion my holy mountain. Let me tell you about what the Lord said to me. You are my son. I have begotten you this very day. Ask me and I'll give you the nations as your inheritance. All the ends of the earth shall be your possession. You smash them with an iron rod. You will smash them to pieces like a clay pot. And now you kings, listen to me and act wisely. Be warned your rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son or he will become angry and you will die in your way because his anger will burst into flames. Blessed is everyone who takes refuge in him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, hello again. Oh, hello, Kwong. And uh, Kwong, who's now doing the, uh, the computer, said, I've been promoted. Yes, you have been promoted one row forward. Well done, Kwong. Uh, today we're looking at Psalm 2. So last week we began at the very beginning, uh, Psalm 1. Today we're looking at Psalm 2. And uh, really both these psalms go together uh, very well and they introduce all 150 psalms. So today there's a, a different emphasis for us to think about. So let's begin by praying. Father, we thank you for these words that were written so long ago, uh, that were talking about your king, about the rulers of this world, and how your king would win, and they would lose, and your grace would reign. And so we ask, Lord, today that as we sit here, that you would speak to us through your word, by your spirit, so that we would understand where we fall, with him or against him. And we ask this in his name and for his glory and for our good. Amen. My friends, once a teacher was invited to go to the birthday party for one of the little girls who was in his uh, kindergarten class. And this teacher you know, politely said yes, and he went to the little girl's birthday party. And he noticed that the mum had done a, a very good job of the party. I mean, all the other kindy kids were there, of course, and the, the decorations were beautiful and 
The birthday cake was just wonderful. But there was a problem at this particular little girl's birthday party. And the problem was a little boy. And this boy was being really, really annoying. He was obviously upset. And he was upset that the presents weren't for him. And he was upset that all the attention was for the girl and not for him. And so this little boy started to make a lot of trouble for everyone. And really the party was you know, a bit of a misery because of this one little boy. But thankfully, one of the mums understood what was happening. And so she went to the little boy. She knelt down beside him. She slowly turned his chair so she could look straight at the little boy's face. And then she very slowly and gently said to him, Peter, it's not your party. And everything changed from that moment. And friends, this little story you know, really begins to show us the problem with us humans and how self-centred and selfish we can be when we're so engrossed in ourselves that we cannot really see what's happening around us. And really here in Psalm 2, it's a little bit like God himself comes to each of us in this room and kneels right beside you, turns your chair slowly so you can see his eyes. And the Lord God himself looks into your eyes and says, it's not your party. You see, in Psalm 2, God is saying something like this whole physical universe it's not about you. It's just not about you. It's not your party. And I think Psalm 2 is really the perfect psalm to follow on from Psalm 1. Because in Psalm 1, the message was, you know, the, the psalm itself was very personal and the message was very personal. And the message was, look, understand who you are. Understand the sort of person you are. Understand whose side you're on. Understand if you are indeed one of the blessed. And if you're not one of the blessed, make sure you become one of the blessed. That was the personal message of Psalm 1. Now, Psalm 2 is like that message, but it's universal. The message of Psalm 2 is for everyone. And the message is understand where history is going and understand that everything in this physical universe has been given to the one and only Son of God, Jesus. Understand that it's not your party. That's the message of Psalm 2 goes perfectly with Psalm 1. Psalm 1 is saying, make sure you're one of the blessed ones. Psalm 2 is saying, understand where history is going. The whole world has been given to Jesus. And Psalm 2 begins with the description of all the leaders of this world. And I've called this description, thank you, Kwong, this is my take on it, the leaders of this world are not happy. That's what the beginning of Psalm 2 talks about. The leaders of this world, they're just not happy. Look at these verses. Thank you, Kwong. See how the psalm begins. Why do the nations rage? And why do the people keep making hopeless plans? Why do the kings of the earth prepare for battle? And why do the rulers make plans against the Lord and against his chosen king, saying, oh, let us free ourselves from God and let's rip off these chains? Friends, that's how Psalm 2 begins. The leaders of this world, they're not happy. And really, if you look around our world today, it's true, isn't it? The leaders, whoever they are, in every country, male or female, young or old, ugly or beautiful, they don't seem very happy, do they? And even their smiles are fake. Even when they're holding those babies getting ready for an election, 
they're not really that happy. There's something wrong. Well, why are they not happy? Well, that's the same question the writer of Psalm 2 has. Why aren't the leaders of the world happy? Why? Why do they rebel against God? Why do they resist his good rule? Why do they come up with all these schemes? Why do they keep resisting the truth that God's king is in control? And really, this week I've been thinking, you know, it doesn't really matter where you live. You can live in a democracy or a dictatorship. You can have a prime minister or a president. You can vote for a congress or a parliament. It doesn't really matter. The problem is still the same. The root problem is the same wherever you go. Whatever leaders you live under, the root problem is the same. And that problem is they do not want to live under the authority of Jesus. That is the problem our leaders have in this world. They resist the truth. They resist the king. And the truth is that this sort of worldwide rebellion is there in every age, every generation. Wherever you look, this rebellion against God, it's, it's always there. Now, sometimes it's very you know, gentle in the background. But sometimes... It's in your face. And this rebellion is vicious and deadly. Sometimes you see it, sometimes you don't. But it's there. And in the Bible, when we read through the Bible, we see one of the clearest examples of the rage of the nations against God is in Acts chapter 4. And if you remember those dark times during the lockdowns last year, we looked at Acts chapter 4 and say, you may remember this story, although you've probably tried to forget about the lockdown. And the story goes, you know, Peter and John were spreading the good news about the risen Jesus and they get arrested. Then they're released. Then they go back to their own people and with great joy they pray. And when they pray, they pray the words of Psalm 2. And this is what they say. And thank you for putting that up earlier, Kwong. There's two slides here. This is Acts 4. See if you can see Psalm 2 here. As soon as Peter and John were released, they went back to their friends and told them what the high priests and the religious leaders had said. When the believers heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. And they said, Sovereign Lord, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant David when he said, Why do the nations rage? Why did they waste their time with futile plans? The kings of the earth prepared for battle. The rulers gathered together against the Lord and against his king. Indeed, in this very city, they were gathered together against your holy servant, Jesus. Both Herod, Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do what your will and hand had decided beforehand should happen. Friends, in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago, who were the angry nations? Who were the angry nations that resisted God's rule? Well, as those first Christians you know, huddled together in that room and prepared to pray, as they thought about what was happening around them, they understood. They understood that the angry leaders were those who opposed Jesus. And in verse 27, we are told exactly who those people were. There was King Herod, Jewish king, Governor Pilate, Roman. There were non-Jews, there were the soldiers. And then, of course, there were the Israelites themselves. 
And all these people, all of them, worked together to destroy the plans of God. That was the angry nations 2,000 years ago. Now, friends, today the names will be different. The names will be different. But the anger and the rage is still there. That angry opposition to the rule of God is still there. And the very nasty truth is that angry opposition falls on the people of God as well. After all, Jesus said it himself. They'll hate you because they hate me. And back in Psalm 2, it really does seem that the writer he seems to know something that these rulers don't really seem to understand because he's astonished at them. He thinks they're stupid and foolish. The writer believes these leaders have no idea to think that they can actually defeat the plans of God. I mean, he's in shock. And that's why he keeps using this word, why? Why are they doing this? I mean, these guys are educated. They're rulers. They, they know what they're doing, don't they? So why do they keep fighting against the Lord? Can't they see that all their plans are in vain? Don't they know who they're up against? It's God, the maker of heaven and earth. Can't they see that? Don't they know that it's not their party? That's what the writer's trying to teach us. Well, friends, sadly, the answer to this question is that the rulers of this world cannot see it. They don't want to see it. They think they can win. They think they can create a utopia without God. A world where there is no need for God. And they can't see the truth. This is God's universe. God's kingdom has come. And God's will will be done. And, friends, that happens in every single generation. And it doesn't matter how much bravado you have, how much hype surrounds you, how many tanks you have, how many ticks you've amassed, how many subscribers you have, how much tech you own. None of that makes any difference at all to God. His plans will be fulfilled. So friends, how does God respond to the haters? Young people are always talking about, you know, ignore the haters. Ignore them. How does God respond to the haters? Well, look at verse 4. Thank you, Quam. This is what God does. He says this, But the one whose throne is in heaven sits laughing. The Lord scoffs at them. Friends, the rulers of the nations, they scoff at God. They laugh at him. They try and take control. They try and create that perfect world where you don't meet God. And God looks at them. He looks at these puny humans with their flimsy plans. He looks at them and he starts laughing at them. Now, I really want you to try, I was trying to do this this week, try and imagine God laughing at people. It's a really hard thing to do. But try it. Try and imagine what it must look like when God looks down and sees all these people, all this bravado. And he starts to laugh at them. He begins to laugh 
uncontrollably at them. He kills himself laughing at them. And really, I think it's a very good thing that he's sitting on his throne when he's laughing. Because if he was standing up and started laughing, he'd be on the floor. Uncontrollable laughter at these little people who think they can stop God. Friends, humans scoff at God only to find God scoffing right back at them. That's the world we live in. And once the laughing is sort of, you know, subsided a little bit, then God looks straight at his enemies, looks them straight in the eye, and he says this, thank you, Kwong. Then God speaks to them in his anger, in his burning fury. He terrifies them, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. Friends, what is God's answer to all this hot air? How does God respond? How does he act? I've installed my king on my hill. So go and look at him. Now, friends, I know you're probably thinking of uh, King Jesus here. You hear these words and you think, well, that sounds like Jesus. And you're right, it is Jesus. These words are about King Jesus. But but before King Jesus, there was King David, and these words are also about King David. And the first time we hear this word Zion, this place, is in the Old Testament, in 2 Samuel, where King David finally defeats the Jebusites after many years, and he finally takes Jerusalem. And there he establishes his capital. And although that victory was a great victory, a a great military victory, glorious, although that victory was great, that place was very humble. Because that area known as Zion, it's tiny. It was something like 11 acres in size. It was a tiny, tiny piece of land in the middle of nowhere. And on that humble piece of land, God set his king, his victorious king. And he says, go to him. But friends, as I said a few moments ago, if you read these words and you are thinking about the Lord Jesus, then you are right. Because these words are also about the Lord Jesus. And about a thousand years after these words were written, God does the same. He sets his king on Mount Zion. That little block of land with three crosses on the top and his son in the middle. And that is God's answer to all human bravado, all human fear, all human pride, all human plans. God's answer is his king on the cross. That is the beginning of God's victory in this world. Now, friends, if you think about some of the words that Psalm uses here to describe the death of Jesus, some of the words are very, very strange, I think. You know, it says here in verses 5 and 6, in his anger, God does it in his fury. And these words are describing the death of Jesus. But if you think about it, as the leaders watched Jesus die, as King Herod or Governor Pilate or the soldiers or the religious leaders, as they stood there and watched Jesus die, I guarantee they were not shaking in their boots in terror. 
They weren't fearing for their lives, expecting that the fury of God was coming on them as they stood there watching this man on a cross. There's no fury there. For them, there's no anger. For them, it was a joke. They laughed, they spat, they mocked. Where is this anger? Where is this fury of God that burns as Jesus dies? The leaders didn't experience it. Why this language? Well, see, I think, friends, we need to rethink this language of God's anger and how we understand that. Because we've all been taught, you know, God's anger means fire and brimstone. It means giant hailstones falling out of the sky and squashing people. God's anger is, you know, people suffering physically forever into eternity. That's God's anger, burning destroying, squashing. That's how we think God's anger is. But friends, that's not how God's anger works. That's how our anger works. You see, the problem is that us humans, when we experience anger in our lives, too often it's uncontrolled, unmeasured, unjust, and sometimes just completely random. That's how we experience anger. And unfortunately, we just take those ideas of anger and just drop them onto God and think, well, you know, his anger must be pretty bad. Much worse than mine. I'm a little guy. He's huge. How burning and ferocious his anger must be. But friends, that's a big mistake. Because God is not like us. So his anger is not like ours. And so this morning I want to give you my definition of God's anger. Thank you, Kwong. God's anger equals. And this is my definition. I think this better explains the way Psalm 2 uses its words and it better explains how Jesus died on the cross. And this is the definition of God's anger that I would like you to think about. God's anger is his settled and committed opposition to evil and sin. God's anger is his settled and committed opposition to evil and sin. It's settled because he's thought about it. He's had a long time to think about it and he's made up his mind. It's committed because he's not going to let go. He's like a dog with a bone. He will not let go of his opposition. He will take it all the way to the end. You can trust him to do that. And what he is so opposed to, committed to, settled in, is evil and sin. That is the anger of God. And that's far more important than hailstones falling out of the sky and squashing him. Far more important than a sea of lava and fire coming. All the things that human anger is like. This is far more impressive. This is loving, relentless commitment against evil and sin. Now, you may never have heard anything like this before, and that's okay. And you may not agree with this definition of God's anger. That's okay too. But think about it. Because I really do think this definition of God's anger 
better explains some too. It better explains how Jesus died on the cross. It better explains what God did on the cross. You see, in God's anger, his calm, powerful, just opposition to evil and sin broke the body of his chosen king. You could turn that into a song, couldn't you? That's God's anger. And I think that's why God laughs at the leaders. You know, he really laughs at the leaders because the leaders didn't see it coming. For all their wisdom and plans and intelligence, they didn't see what God was doing on the cross. And they were there. They were watching. They were there watching Jesus and they didn't understand what God was doing. They laughed at him, spat at him. They thought they won and Jesus lost. And God scoffs, shrugs his shoulders and says, you've got it all wrong. You lost. I won. Evil and sin are defeated. Now, we've just finished the book of Colossians, and you might remember early in the book of Colossians, Paul sort of explains what was achieved on the cross. So thank you, Kwong. Let's have a look. This is what the Apostle Paul says happened on the cross. Paul says God cancelled the record of death that was against us and he took it away by nailing it to the cross. This is how God disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities by shaming them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. See, the smart rulers think, hey, we've won. God says, no, you haven't. I've won. I won by putting my king on the cross. And no one, no one can undo that. Friends, that's what the settled and committed anger of the Lord has done. Final victory over sin and evil and death and no hail required. It's wonderful. It's magnificent. It is truly life changing. Jesus rules over all. And so, of course, now there's an offer that God makes. Thank you, Kwong. This is what God says to every ruler, every person. Verse 10, and now you kings, listen to me and act wisely. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son or he will become angry and you will die in your way because his anger will burst into flames. Friends, this is a very generous offer by God. I mean, he's offering this mercy, this kindness to the very same people who resisted him, the very same people who made all those plans the, with all that bravado and, and pride. God makes the same offer of forgiveness to them. And he says, come. But you see, friends, that's what the Lord God is like. He is full of mercy and compassion in his anger, in his committed, settled opposition to evil and sin. He is full of compassion. And he gives us a lot of room to move. 
a lot of space. The invitation is there. I've done everything required. Look at the cross. I've won. Look at the cross. It's empty. He is risen. It's up to you. The time is now for all mankind to make up our minds. Whose side will we be on? With the leaders, with the rulers in great pride, trying to create this fictional utopia without God? Or will we be blessed and live our lives with Jesus as our King? And really, I think that's why the last words in this psalm have the word blessed in them. Thank you, Kwong. And this is where we're going to finish because this is where the psalmist finishes, right at the beginning, back to the beginning, back to being blessed, being that tree planted by streams of water, sucking in all that goodness, producing fruit at the right time, never being dry. So let's listen to these words. Blessed is everyone who takes refuge in him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you very much for what you have achieved through your son, Jesus. And we have so much noise around us, so much pride, so much distractions, so many things that take our eyes and our heart away from your son and his powerful victory and his gracious hand that is there each day. Father, please help us, Lord, to see things as they are, to understand it's a great party. It's just not ours, but we've been invited. Lord, please help us to live our lives with him, unashamed, as committed and settled as you are. And we ask that by your spirit and your word, you will do this work in us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, thank you, Kwong. We have uh, two questions for you to discuss. Uh, the first one is, what has God taught you from Psalm 2? So with the people around you, uh, talk about you know, what you've learned, what God has said to you today. And also, if you could think about, you know, how is this different to Psalm 1? We looked at that last week. You know, how is it different? Maybe how is it similar? How do these go together? So you've got five minutes uh, to talk with the people around you, and then after that we're going to pray. So enjoy your discussions. Hello, everyone. We're going to wrap up now. Sounds like you had some good chats, um, but we're going to pray now. Um, in response to what we heard. So please join me in prayer. God, we can see that the world is not happy. We can see that there are many people around us who laugh and say there is no God. There are many, many people who ignore you. They want life without you as God. But God, you are not surprised by this. You're not embarrassed or unsure. You laugh at the people who reject you. You laugh because Jesus is your powerful king and one day everyone will see that you are the one who rules in heaven. So as we speak to you, we tremble and we rejoice at the same time. We are humble as we sit here and we remember who you are. God, we have joy because we can take refuge in you. You are a God who's in control and you're a God who protects us. Please protect Michael and Rani and their baby Alexi as they prepare to go to Belgium. Thank you that they're leaving behind comfort and family so that people in Belgium can hear that you are king. 
And God, we pray for Miriam. Thank you so much for her and for the time that we've had with her at this church. God, you care for her and her family very much. Please comfort them as they grieve the passing of Miriam's uncle. And Father, we ask that in your kindness, the people at Nawi Baptist Church can be a wonderful and supportive church family for Miriam. You are a God who cares for your people in every place. We think of Dan and Natasha in Ganadar, and we ask that they can settle in well to a new town. Help them to keep their eyes on Jesus as they go through the busyness of unpacking and meeting new people. And Father, we just thank you that in all of these things, we are a people who are blessed because of Jesus. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, as we finish today, we're going to bless one another, saying the words that you can see there on the screen. May the God of hope fill you with joy and peace as you continue to trust him. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Enjoy your morning tea.